Get on your hard hat, because today we're constructing some concrete poetry. What? What's that? It's not poetry made from concrete. It's more like visual art. Get on your beret, because today we're constructing some concrete poetry. Hey guys, I'm Dr. Katie Ailes from I'm Lab Productions, and in today's workshop, I'm going to teach you how to compose concrete poetry. Also known as visual poetry or shape poetry, this is a form of writing in which how it looks is fundamental to what it means. It's a really interesting combination of creative writing and visual art with a lot of possibilities for how you can do it. So warm up your noggins and let's get experimental. In today's workshop, I'm going to explain what concrete poetry is, go over the history and the context of it a little bit, give you a lot of examples, and then take you step by step through how to write one yourself. If you've been taking my other workshops in the Return to Form series, you'll notice that this one's going to be slightly different. I'm going to spend more time going over the history and different approaches to concrete poetry than I did in the other forms. I'm doing that because the different ways that artists have approached doing concrete poetry, the different options for this form, have changed, evolved, expanded so much over the years. So I want to show you a lot of different examples before I get you writing so that you have a better feel for what this form can be. Then I'm going to get you started in writing your own concrete poetry by, first of all, giving you some guidance. Secondly, leading you step by step through one possible approach of doing it. And thirdly, by giving you some tips for expanding and innovating within this genre. Just like with the rest of my workshops, there are two different ways that you can approach this video. The first is that when I do lead you step by step through that exercise, you can pause at the different steps and write along. The other option is that you can just watch this video all the way through, get all of these ideas, all these examples, all this guidance, and then try your hand at writing concrete poetry later in your own time. All that you need for this workshop is something to write with and something to write on. In my step-by-step -step exercise, I do suggest that you use pen and paper simply because of the visual nature of concrete poetry. It can be a lot easier to draft, at least initially on paper, but at one point I give you a digital option as well. So there are a variety of ways of going about this workshop. Just use whatever you're most comfortable with. This workshop and our entire Return to Form project is supported by the National Lottery through Creative Scotland. To see all of the videos that we've created in this project, please subscribe to our channel and please do like and share this video if you enjoy it. All right, guys, here we go. So far, all of the poetic forms that we've covered in this workshop series have been, well, forms of poetry. You'd find them taught in literature and creative writing departments. Concrete poetry is fascinating because not only is it a form of poetry, but it's also a form of visual art. It's funny, as I was preparing this workshop, I kept finding myself saying writing concrete poetry, and then I thought, well, really, that's not all that it is. You could also say drawing or sculpting or digitizing or animating concrete poetry. This is a form of art and a form of poetry which is just as much about the visual effect as it is about the text, and ideally those two elements work together seamlessly to create the whole. So what do I mean here? What exactly is concrete poetry? You might need a concrete example at this point. Let me take you through the history of it because, as I said earlier, it's massively evolved and changed over time. Interestingly, the history of concrete poetry is very similar to the history of univocal poetry, and I laid that out in my workshop on univocal poetry, which you can watch just up there. Um, these are both forms of poetry that have existed really as long as writers have played with language and, you know, particularly in this form, innovated with text and images. But they were really popularized in the mid-1900s by groups of experimental, more avant-garde artists. Before that, though, stretching way back, you can find examples of what we now would call concrete poetry in many, many different cultures stretching back centuries, even millennia, depending on how you look at it. For instance, there is a long and rich tradition in multiple religions of arranging holy texts in visually significant patterns. This includes the Hebrew practice of micrography, which is using Hebrew letters to form images. It also includes the Islamic practice of calligraphy, using Arabic letters to form images. These are fascinating practices, and I've linked to more information about them in the video description below. Much of this material was based in religion, until around the 16 and 1700s when poets started to play a little bit with visually arranging their texts. 
This really took off, though, in the early to mid-1900s in Western society, though. That's when we started actually calling the form concrete poetry, experimenting within it, and coming to more solid definitions of what it could mean. An early 20th century pioneer of concrete poetry was the French poet Guillaume Apollinaire. Around World War I, Apollinaire published Caligram, Poems of Peace and War, 1913-1916. In these poems, the way in which they're laid out on the page is just as important to their meaning as the text itself. The visuals and the language work in tandem. One of Apollinaire's most famous calligram is called Cheval, which in French means horse, and it was first exhibited in 1917 in Paris. The poem both outlines and fills in the shape of a horse through the writing. Rolling ahead several decades, uh, around the 1950s and 60s, this idea of concrete poetry as an innovative cross-disciplinary genre really exploded globally. Groups of poets and artists in various cultures around the world began experimenting with combining text and images in increasingly weird and innovative and interesting ways. So the Guillaume Apollinaire image that I showed you, the poem Cheval, is a relatively simple, though highly effective way of creating concrete poetry. In concrete poetry like that, the subject of the poem is the shape. So the poem either outlines or fills in or otherwise represents the shape of the subject of the poem. In this mid-century boom, though, poets and visual artists began to push past those ideas and really push the envelope of what concrete poetry could mean. So they took it beyond poems that were in the shapes of the things that the poems were about and really started to play with the possibilities of arranging texts on the page and off the page too. For example, take this fascinating 3D piece of concrete poetry from 1969 by the acclaimed Brazilian poets and artists Augusto de Campos and Julio Plaza. These two were at the forefront of the concrete poetry movement in Brazil and created many three-dimensional tactile pieces of concrete poetry which change based on your perspective. We here in Scotland have a particularly rich tradition of concrete poetry, thanks chiefly to the poets Ian Hamilton Finlay and Edwin Morgan. One of my favorite examples of concrete poetry, because it's just so darn creative and fun but with a deeper meaning, is Edwin Morgan's Chaffinch Map of Scotland from 1965. So a little bit of context here. Uh, the chaffinch is a bird which, somewhat like the mockingbird, picks up on regional dialects, and so their songs sound slightly different depending on where they are. So those familiar with Scotland will recognize that this is a map of Scotland, at least kind of, more or less. <laughs> it's in the shape of the country. And what it's doing is that it shows what the local people call chaffinches in that area. So, for example, you can see that around where I presume Edinburgh would be, it says shilfi, because that is the local term. You also have chaffy and chai and britchy, even all the way down in the southwest. So this poem is an example of how there can be so much meaning and so many different interpretations all packed into a map with words. So it is just text and images, but there's so much that you can get out of it. Ian Hamilton Finlay is another poet and visual artist who really stretched the boundaries of what we consider to be concrete poetry. Some of his concrete poetry is literally concrete. He played a lot with using large architectural structures and stone carvings within his work. One of the most impressive feats of concrete poetry worldwide is Finlay's garden in the Pentlands near Edinburgh called Little Sparta. It was developed both by Finlay and his wife Sue Finlay and some collaborators. It features over 270 artworks set into specifically chosen places in the five-acre landscape, and most of these artworks are examples of concrete poetry. Little Sparta is a clear demonstration that concrete poetry is definitely not limited to arranging text in different shapes on a page. It can be three-dimensional, and it can be big. And this just goes to show that so many of the pieces of concrete poetry that we consider to be canon, that we consider to be integral to the genre, you might not immediately think of as poetry at all. For example, take Mary Ellen Soltz's 1965 piece Forsythia. For the most part, it spells out the word Forsythia, with eight other words and an acrostic along the bottom. 
You might think of this more as a piece of visual art, but because it falls into the category of a creative use of text where the visual element contributes to its meaning, this does technically count as a concrete poem. A good rule of thumb for a concrete poem is the question, if you were to perform this poem out loud without showing the audience the visual of the poem, would they get the full meaning? If the answer to that question is no, they wouldn't get it, they need to see the poem arranged in its proper form in order to fully grasp it, then good job, you've created a concrete poem. For example, if I just read the text of Ian Hamilton Finley's poem Ho Horizon On from 1968, you might be a little confused. Let's try that out. <clears throat> horizon. Ho Horizon On. Ho Ho Horizon On On. Ho, 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 horizon on, 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 ho, 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 horizon on, 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 on. It goes on like that a bit. However, when I show you the poem, you can see how the horizon, and possibly the setting sun, is represented through the text. Critics have also observed some possible deeper meanings that could be read into this poem about mortality and the on and on and on nature of later life. One of the great things about concrete poetry is how much meaning it can suggest with so little, opening up lots of possible interpretations. A final way of thinking about concrete poetry is like comic books or graphic novels. There too, if you just have the isolated text, you're not getting the full story, you're not getting the full picture. You need both to get the full meaning. Okay, that was a lot of history and context. It's time to take all of that into your brain, take all of that inspiration, all of those different approaches, and use them to create your own concrete poem. So as I mentioned at the start of this workshop, there are some forms of poetry which have a lot of rules and steps to follow in creating them, like sonnets and sestinas, for example. Then there are some other forms where there's really only one kind of rule, and the main thing that you need to do in developing them is come up with your concept and then run from there. Concrete poetry is definitely one of the latter kinds of poetry. There are so many different ways of approaching this genre, and the specific steps that you're going to need in creating your poem will depend on the idea that you've decided to roll with. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start out by giving you some general guidance about how to start thinking about creating your own concrete poetry. Next, I'm going to lead you step by step through how to create the most fundamental form of concrete poetry, which is a poem shaped like the subject of the poem. After that, I'm going to give you some general pointers on other approaches that you might want to take to this art form. And then I'll wrap up the workshop and let you decide what approach you want to take in creating your concrete poem. All right, let's kick off. So composing concrete poetry presents a sort of a chicken or egg question. Which comes first, the shape, the visuals, or the language, the text? In a perfect, imaginary, creative world, your concept would arrive fully formed, with the shape and the language working in perfect tandem. But most of the time, the creative process is a little bit more stop-and-go than that. Realistically, a lot of the time when developing concrete poetry, we start with either the shape or the text and then work to bring them together. So if that's how you're doing it, that is totally fine. Whatever starting point you're using, ideally as you're composing your concrete poem, you're sort of juggling both of these elements at the same time. So you're constantly considering how can the text best serve the image and vice versa. How can the image best serve the text? You're not focusing only on one and neglecting the other one until the end. One such approach that I would definitely advise against is starting with a finished poem and then trying to put it into some sort of shape after the fact, like going through your back catalog, finding a poem that mentions trees, and then whacking it into the shape of a tree somehow. You really want to be working with both of these elements from the beginning. So how do we do that? In a moment, I'm going to lead you step by step through how to create one of the most fundamental forms of concrete poetry, a poem where the shape of the poem is the subject of the poem. For example, in our Return to Form video, Georgia Bartlett McNeil wrote an ode to Edinburgh, and her poem takes the shape of a traditional tenement flat that you would commonly find in Edinburgh. As I discussed earlier, over history there have been so many different approaches to creating concrete poetry, so this is just one of many. 
But even if you're interested in maybe doing something conceptually different with your concrete poem, I would still advise you to go through these steps with me now to warm up your brain and get yourself thinking visually about text. So as I said earlier, often concrete poetry starts with either the shape or the text. Here in this exercise, we're going to sort of do both at the same time. So our first step is going to be choosing a concept for our poem, which we can describe textually, but also represent visually. So for this exercise, you're going to need to choose a concept that has a material shape. And by that, I mean something that you could see in your mind's eye and that you think that you could represent visually on the page. For my example in this workshop, I'm going to use fire. I know what fire looks like, and I think that even with my pretty abysmal drawing skills, I could outline or sketch some flames. And this is also a concept that I think that I could write a lot of material on to possibly use in my concrete poem. If you want to, you could pick a slightly more abstract idea. So for example, say that you want to write about love. There are different shapes and visual images that we use to represent love, like, you know, the stereotypical love heart or like uh, two people holding hands, for example. Or let's say that you want to write about graduating school. You could use a graduation cap to represent that. Whatever you choose as a subject of your poem, just make sure that it's something that you can visualize and that you can realistically create on paper. So, for example, I'm not going to write about my experience of visiting the Sistine Chapel for my concrete poem because there is no way that I can represent that in poetry on the page. I'm confident in my abilities, but not that confident. So first step of the exercise here, in the next screen, if you're writing along with me, pause the video and select the concept that you're going to write your concrete poem about. All right, now that you've got your concept, it's time for the next step. And this is the next step for the majority of poetry that you're going to be writing, whether it's visual poetry or any other form. We're going to start with the familiar here. I'm going to ask you to brainstorm and free write about the concept that you've chosen, just so that we can start getting ideas and descriptions down on the page, material that we can then start to work with to mold into our concrete poem. So here I'm just making a simple word map, and I'm writing down as many words, phrases, concepts, and descriptions as I can possibly think of that have to do with fire. And as I'm doing this, I'm keeping in mind all five senses. So the smell of it, you know, how it's acrid and, you know, the appearance of it, smoky and flames and the colors of it, all of that. I'm also thinking about things that look like fire. So I have flowers and waves here. I'm thinking about both the positive and negative connotations of fire both its destructive power, but also its ability to clean and to cauterize. All right, your turn. So set up a word map or whatever means of brainstorming ideas works best for you and just write down as many things as you can possibly think of that have to do with your concept. Okay, rolling right along. So now that we've got all of these ideas brainstormed, we're going to start expanding them and start writing material that we could potentially use. And in doing this, we're going to use two different techniques that I've used before in these workshops. So one is called panning for gold and one is called free writing. Let me show you in my example. So here I'm starting a new page for my initial drafting. And the first thing I'm going to do is go back to my brainstorming sheet and highlight concepts that I find particularly interesting. So I really like this idea of fire is cleansing because I don't think we talk a lot about that when we talk about fire. Um, and I really like this idea that the flames look like flowers and waves. I find that interesting and I think that might be something to play with. Um, and also, I really like all of these adjectives here, scarred, singed, acrid, burnt, you know, these sorts of adjectives. I think that they're really vivid and I want to sort of play with them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring these ideas over to my new page. This is what we call panning for gold. And I'm just going to free write. I'm going to write as much as I possibly can expanding these ideas. You're not writing your poem just yet. We're just warming up our brains and getting material down on the page. <laughs> 
All right, your turn. So begin a new page for your initial drafting. Highlight some ideas from your original word map that you can bring over and start to expand them. Start free writing as much as you possibly can about your concept. All right, so, so far in this exercise, we've just been working with text, with language. Um, a sort of a messy analogy is that if you think of a concrete poem like a sculpture, what we've been doing so far is gathering our clay, getting it nice and squishy or whatever ceramicists do, and getting it ready to mold into the shape that we want. So now it's time to start that sculpting process. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you three different possible options that you can use to get your text and create a shape from it. With each of these options, I'm going to demonstrate it using my example, and I'm going to show you all three of the options without any pause screens. Then I'm going to give you a pause screen to try it out, see whichever approach you like best, test that out on your work. Of course, feel free to pause at any time that the inspiration strikes if you prefer to do that. The first step for all three of the approaches that I'm going to show you is simply to sketch out your concept, to try figuring out how it works visually and ensure that you have a template to work with for when you actually create your concrete poem. So I'm showing you here with a Sharpie so that you can really see what I'm doing, um, but normally I would do this in pencil so that it's easy to erase if you make a mistake. And I'm just going to sketch the basic shape of fire. And here we see why I am a poet and definitely not a visual artist. But hey, this doesn't have to be perfect. It is just a template so that we know what rough shape we're going for. All right, your turn. So take a moment, sketch out the shape that you're planning on using for your concrete poem. Totally fine if this changes later. We're just getting things down so that we can play with them as we move forward through the exercise. Okay, now that you have your image sketched out, it's time for me to show you the three possible approaches that you could take for creating your concrete poem. The first approach that I'm going to show you is tracing the outlines of the shape of your concept with your text. This is one of the techniques that Guillaume Apollinaire used in his concrete poem Cheval. So you can see here how the top of the horse's head is traced using a line of the poem. So here in my example, I'm tracing the flames and the logs in a single line of writing. I'm using material for my free write with some changes and additions. And one of the interesting things about this approach is that you're effectively writing one single long line of poetry, which may get bent and broken in various places depending on your shape. There is a lot of creative choice here. How does a line bending over the tip of a flame affect its meaning, for example? One thing to consider in writing it this way is where do you want certain material to fall? So for example, when I'm outlining the logs, I probably don't want to be writing about smoke. I want to be writing about logs, unless I'm doing something subversive and interesting, which is obviously totally an option on the table. Okay, so that's the tracing approach in a nutshell. The second approach that I'm going to show you is filling in the shape of the poem with your text in horizontal lines. This is the technique that George Starbuck used in his poem Sonnet in the Shape of a Potted Christmas Tree. The poem fills in and thus creates the shape of the tree, rather than outlining it as we did in the previous exercise. Look at Starbuck flexing there doing both a sonnet and a concrete poem. Show off. In this example, I'm showing you two very similar versions of the same approach. For the flames, I'm filling them in with the text horizontally on the page, like George Starbuck did for his Christmas tree and like Georgia Bartlett McNeil did in our Return to Form video. In contrast to the tracing approach, with filling in you tend to get lines of weird lengths. Uh, so some are very short, some are very long, and they might cut off in one place and reappear in another. This can be really fun to play with. For example, do you want people to be able to read the poem vertically down each flame? Uh, for the logs, my writing is still in straight lines, but at an angle inside the shape of the logs. So it's not quite horizontal, but it is still straight lines. You could also bend your lines using this approach. So there are, again, a whole lot of options here. <laughs> 
Okay, one final option that I'm going to show you here. So this option is simultaneously more abstract and more simple, and it is creating the shape of the poem through text which describes what part each of the shape is. Let me show you with examples. This is more or less the technique that Edwin Morgan uses in his Chaffinch Map of Scotland. So you can see that the names for the chaffinches correspond to the areas where they fall on the map. It's a bit like a key. So where these things are placed, where the words are placed on the map in the concrete poem is significant here. So in my example, again, what I've done is I've started by tracing my shape in pencil, and then I'm filling it in using language that describes each part. And I'm going to start here with the logs and show you a couple of different ways that you could do this. So one approach, as I'm doing with one log, is to make the shape of the thing with a single word, a giant logs. Another approach is to write that word many times quite small, logs, 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 to form the shape of the thing. This is a little bit similar to what we saw Mary Ellen Salt do with Forsythia. A third approach, and the one that I like the best because it involves more creative language, is to write descriptive words which describe that thing to fill in the shape. So here in the log area, I'm writing brown, bark, and rough. And once you're done with one part of your shape, you can just move on to another part. So I'm continuing with that last strategy for the flames and using words like fiery, red, orange, blue, and then up here, I've tried to get really creative and I have a spark flying out and then I have smoke up at the top of the page. And a final touch here and something that you could really do with all of these steps is to add color. You could use colored markers, crayons, pencils, paint even. Um, you could use those from the beginning to actually write the words in color or you could fill in the shape in various colors at the end, whatever floats your boat. Okay, so those were three possible options that you can take in approaching concrete poetry. Again, there are about a gazillion other ways of doing it, but to keep this workshop short, we're just going to cover those three. For this next step, I want you to choose which approach you think would work best for your poem. So there is outlining, there is filling in horizontally with text, or there is filling in more artistically or creatively with words that describe each part of the concrete poem. You could also try maybe using a combination of these techniques. Do whatever feels good to you, maybe try multiple techniques on multiple pages and have a play around. So here I would suggest that you draw upon the text that you've already drafted, but don't feel limited by it. You can compose totally new material to fit your shape. And you can also go beyond your template, try something new. Whatever feels best to you, whatever is zhuzhing with your creative energy, go along with that. Hopefully that went well and you now have a better sense of how text and language can really come together to create really interesting creative work. We're not going to do any more steps in this workshop focusing on that piece, but I really hope that you continue developing it in your own time after this workshop. Maybe your drafts are really messy, like I know mine are, and you want to copy over what you have onto a new page and keep working with it. That would be great. Maybe you want to make it digital or three-dimensional or color it in from the beginning. Whatever the case may be, just be playful and keep thinking about how the language and the shape can serve each other and together how they can create new meaning. So now that we've gone through that exercise and you hopefully have a better understanding of some of the options for creating concrete poetry, for the rest of this workshop, I'm going to give you general guidance on how to develop this form and innovate within it, as well as some specific guidance for digital creation of concrete poetry. I haven't included any pause screens in the rest of the workshop as I'm not so much leading you through steps as just giving you advice, but obviously if at any time the inspiration strikes, please, please pause me and go ahead and work on it. So in that exercise, I was showing you how to create a concrete poem free form on a sheet of paper with a marker. You might instead be interested in working on a digital device, so maybe creating a concrete poem using a photo or another image. Let's talk through how you might want to do that. So this digital creation strategy is what Stuart Kenny used in composing his concrete poem, Kirketten. 
which is an ode to that mountain in the Pentlands outside Edinburgh. So here I'm going to quickly show you the strategy that Stuart used in setting up this poem. And I'm going to focus more on the technical side rather than the imaginative creative side. But effectively the process that Stuart used was similar to the second uh, strategy that we looked at there. So he started with a visual, started with this concept, wrote material around this concept, and then worked to ensure that the material matched the shape of that concept. To create a concrete poem digitally like Stuart did, you obviously need some form of digital device, so that might be a computer or a tablet or even your phone, and you're going to need some software that allows you to manipulate images and text. This doesn't have to be a big expensive software package, there's plenty of free packages that you can use. You could even do this on Instagram if you wanted to, right? So use whatever you feel most comfortable with that allows you to play with text and images. So without going too far into Stuart's creative process here, he knew that he was writing about the mountain Kirketon in the Pentlands, and he found a photograph of the mountain on which to base his poem, which is credited to the photographer Dave Henniker. Next, Stuart did some drafting to generate the text of his poem, and he specifically worked to ensure that his lines were of uneven lengths to match the ridges and curves of Kirketon. The text itself is about that unevenness, that natural character of the mountain. So this way, when the text of the poem is flipped sideways and superimposed on the photograph of the mountain, Stuart could adjust it to ensure that the ends of his lines roughly formed the shape of Kirketon. So this way, when the original template photograph is removed, the shape of the mountain remains. This meant that when we went to animate the poem for our return to form video, we could easily fit it into the suggestion of a mountain range so that it was evident even before the text was read out what the subject of the poem was. So this is a great way to approach digitally creating concrete poetry, beginning with a photograph or some other image, creating some text, and then manipulating the text to match the shape of that image. And of course, that is definitely not all that you can do with digital media. With all of the technology that we have today, don't feel like your concrete poetry has to be limited to a static shape, whether that's two-dimensional or even three-dimensional. You can create a video concrete poem, an animation, something like that. As long as the text and the visuals interact to form the meaning, that's a concrete poem, whether it's on the page, a sculpture, or a video, whatever form it takes. So my main piece of guidance for writing in this style, and the note that I want to end this workshop on, is that whatever approach you take to writing your concrete poetry, or I should say to composing and creating your concrete poetry, think outside the envelope, think outside the page, think outside the computer, think outside the sculpture, Think big, think broad, think innovative and creative. The world is your oyster here. There are very, very few limitations to this art form. As long as you are marrying the text and the image, the visual, the shape in some way where both interact to form meaning, you are doing concrete poetry. As always, I would love to see what you come up with from this workshop. If you feel comfortable doing so, please leave your concrete poems in the comments box below. Or if they're too weird and big to fit in the YouTube comments, share them with us on our social media. You can find all of those links in the description below. As well, if you enjoyed this workshop, please do like and share and subscribe to see all of the rest of the workshops and poems that we provide on our channel. You can watch the rest of the workshops in our Return to Form series up at this playlist, and you can watch all of the poems created through this project, including the ones that I mentioned in this video, at this playlist. Thank you so much, guys, and happy creating!